Welcome to Watch Symposium. I'm Austin, and this is a custom video for Treetop Flyer. Now, Treetop Flyer is a pilot, and he's also a lifelong watch enthusiast. And in this video, we're going to take a look at his early years as a watch guy. We're going to look at his first good watch. We're going to look at his first Rolex. And then in the second video, we're going to take a look at his whole collection and go into his pieces in detail. We're also going to touch in this video on the theme that has to do with the title, all right? So let's get into the first part of his email. Hey, Austin, been a longtime viewer of your channel. I really enjoy it. I always look forward to the new video notifications on YouTube. Thank you, Treetop Flyer. I do appreciate that. I'm quite excited to have your take on my relatively humble collection. I have finally reached a state of what I can only call satisfaction. How long it will last is anyone's guess. But it's the first time I've felt this way in a long time and I'd love your opinion on the collection. My watch history goes back for as long as I can remember. My father was and still is a big watch lover. As a kid, I would go through his collection in his drawer and try on all of his watches. I was fascinated by them. As a kid, every year for my birthday, my dad would take me to the local store where I'd get to pick out my own watch on the rotating display. Sometimes it would be a digital watch, sometimes a traditional looking watch, never an expensive watch, but I always looked forward to it every year. All right, so Treetop Flyer is an organically grown watch enthusiast, and that's great that his dad is into it as well. I'd be curious to know what kind of watches his dad is into, high-end watches, mid-tier watches, just kind of regular watches, any particular brands, Rolex, does he have any Rolex? But that's, uh, that's a good common interest that they have. Eventually, he got to what was his first good watch, or quote, expensive watch, he says, and he puts expensive in quotes because by today's standards, it wouldn't even get you a service at an RSC, all right? So he says, my very first expensive watch was a Seiko Flightmaster that I bought after graduating from flight school when I was about 20 years old. It was $600 at the time, and I had to go to the jewelry store every two weeks on payday to put more money down on layaway before I got to take it home. I still have it, and it will forever be in my collection. And hold on to it. So it's always good to keep your first good watch, your first real watch. For me, it was my first mechanical watch. All right, looking at this watch, it's a two-tone watch, and I'm not sure if it's real gold or gold-plated or just gold tone. It's on a Jubilee-styled bracelet. It's a quartz chronograph. It's got a, an attractive blue aluminum bezel, white dial, four subdials, and the rings on the subdials match the bezel. And a lot going on with the dial. I can see why a new pilot would have been attracted to this watch. It kind of reminds me of a Breitling Navitimer. 12 years later, I graduated to a Breitling Navitimer. That makes sense, being a pilot. The Flight Master on steroids. That was my first dip in the serious watch pool. It's been pure addiction ever since. Over the years, I have bought and sold countless watches. Breitling, Omega, Hamilton, Chopard, Steinhardt, Frederick, Constant, Long Jeans, you name it, all right? And that has to do with the theme today. And when it comes to Rolex, be careful being a flipper. Interestingly enough, I didn't get my first Rolex until I turned 40. Until then, I hadn't liked the image Rolex portrayed. It took me a while to really appreciate the quality, heritage, and value of a Rolex. And had I known what their prices would do, I would have bought exclusively Rolex. Live and learn, I suppose. And that's interesting because his first exposure to Rolex was one of an image he didn't really like. And my guess it was, and this is me having looked at his collection and seen what kind of watches he likes, it was probably a two-tone watch or precious metal watch, maybe a date just with a fluted bezel, something fancy. And that is probably the household image of Rolex. You know, I would love to do an experiment and ask people who aren't watch people, Rolex, describe it. You know, what would they describe? Probably a gold watch, probably a precious metal watch, probably a date just. And 
I hear people get into watches and at first they hate Rolex and then they come around or they love Rolex, they get into it, they start to hate Rolex and then they come around. And I think the coming around part is the coming around to the origins of Rolex as usable professional watches. And that's the most interesting angle of Rolex in my opinion. So he had to overcome that initial image of Rolex that uh, a lot of people have, you know, the businessman's watch, the the Wall Street wanker watch. You know, if you check out Wolf of Wall Street, great scene with with Matthew McConaughey and he's sporting a two-tone date just, okay? So that's worth checking out. Mm -hmm. I do that before my videos sometimes, by the way. All right, anyway, speaking of which, I bought my first Rolex for my 40th birthday, a Rolex GMT Master II 116710 LN, and that's the ceramic all black GMT Master II on the oyster bracelet with the polished middle links, discontinued end of an era of those monocolored bezeled GMT Master IIs. They'll be bicolored from here on out, I think we can safely say. And he says, admittedly, I had always wanted a Pepsi GMT after watching Magnum PI as a kid. And that's a Pepsi, I think it was a 1675 that Magnum's father had. He gets it when he's just a kid. There's a whole episode that's related to that where he's in the ocean and, and he gets flashbacks of, of, of the watch and it's on his wrist and man, that's, that's like right up there with James Bond. It put the GMT on the map for many people just like James Bond put the sub on the map for many people. Yeah, Magnum PI, pretty cool. Love the mustache, right? I almost went for a five digit Pepsi at the time of my 40th birthday, but the GMT ceramic was recently released and I liked the new design, so I pulled the trigger on the 116710 LN, and I paid $5,600 for it, if you can believe it. Fantastic price, and that's how you do it, guys. You get in early, you hold your pieces, and he could have gotten out of it a couple years later. I remember they were going right before they were discontinued for eight, and he could have gotten clever, flipped it, made three, but then it was discontinued and it jumped up. And I'm sure he really is happy that he has held on to it. And there's a lesson there. Don't sell your Rolex watches. We're gonna explore that a little bit later. As of late, I've been trying to collect some nice Rolex pieces. First off, I just love the classic look, usefulness, quality, and appeal of Rolex. And secondly, I was tired of losing my shirt for years selling and trading non-Rolex pieces. Rolexes just keep their value, period. I know value retention shouldn't be the only deciding factor when buying a watch, but it has become a serious consideration for me. So ultimately, Rolex checks off most of my boxes. The only thing I hate now is the BS around the whole AD purchasing game. I can't stand it. You and me both, Treetop Flyer, but it's just part of the value retention equation, all right? So as much as we hate it, it probably works out for us. And, and you've got a watch you paid about five and a half grand for that's worth well over a 10 because of that. So yeah, all right. Now he touches on some aspects and that's him flipping watches. And I think he knows better than to flip Rolex watches, but many people don't. And I think there's two types of Rolex regret. There's the unrealistic regret that I think all of us feel. I wish I'd gotten into Rolex sooner. Instead of playing with He-Man and G.I. Joes, I wish I was collecting pre-ceramic GMTs and, and mill subs and all of that stuff. Well, that's unrealistic, okay? that's. Uh, taking your 40 plus year old self and projecting those interests on that little boy that had no interest in mechanical watches at the time, all right? Would have been great, but unrealistic. But then there's realistic Rolex regret. And that comes from the people that bought Rolex. It went up a bit and then they sold it. 
And I think there's some karmic justice at play here when it comes to the betrayal of those older Rolex watches. You know, I think it's fitting that here you got these people that bought these watches back in the day and then they flipped them and thought they were so clever making a buck or $3,000 on the transaction and they never loved that watch, okay? If you love a watch, you're not gonna sell it, all right? And if the price goes up enough and you're tempted and you sell that watch out, you gotta question whether you actually love the watch. And the karmic justice is this. They think back on those watches and those watches whisper to them now, look at me, look at me today. Look at what you could have had. Look what kind of collection you could have had. What kind of vintage collection, what kind of neo vintage collection, but you sold me out. You got clever. You got your $3,000 and I hope you're happy with it, buddy, because look at me now. And you can tell those people because they often denigrate older Rolex watches. They'll say something about the clasp. And that's because these pieces whisper to them about their mistake on a daily basis. And it goes to the fact that they probably never loved the watches. And you know what? They sold them. They got out. They thought they were clever doing it. But now they know they made a mistake. And it haunts them. Those pre-ceramic pieces whisper on a daily basis. You screwed up. You never loved me. And that's your karma there, buddy. All right? These pre-ceramic pieces apparently are pretty nasty little things, all right? Stay on the good side. Love them. Don't sell them, all right? And that's a lesson we can all learn. And I think Treetop Flyer understands that. Thanks for watching. Take care. Let me know what you think, and I'll see you in part two.